Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to The Attic. In this video, which is the second in a series of rebuttals, I'll be sharing more of my thoughts on the 2023 Exercise Patience Convention of Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witness Regional Conventions are an annual event spanning three days of talks and videos that give a major insight into the expectations placed on believers by the faithful and discreet slave or governing body. And the Friday afternoon session of this year's convention proved to be no exception. So without further ado, let's roll the first clip. Thomas, my brother. Winston, you all right? Fine, fine. What's going on here? Just a minute, Winston. It is dusty up there, Winston. And this unit is ancient. But I think I've got it sorted. Oh. Yeah, I've measured up so I can price the parts. Should have it working properly in no time. I see. What was it again? Did the LDC say they were going to provide us with some more direction? Yeah, they said they would address these needs in the best way possible, but that may take some time. We can solve this now. Mm. Well, there is another problem that needs your attention right now. Maybe you can help me with it. It's good to see someone else to be a help. Oh, here we go. You know, we just did this. Mm. You look away for a minute, and they spring up again. Mm. Gardening, you know, is hard work. It takes time and patience. Seems like I have little of either lately. Let me ask you something. When you picture Jesus, what do you see? Hmm. A mighty king in heaven. Yes, yes. On the white horse with his bow in hand. Jesus has a power and the desire to do so much. But he waits until his father gives the word. He had to wait a long time to become king of God's kingdom. And he still waits to rescue us. Yeah, you're right. Jehovah's way is always the best way. It's okay to wait if you're waiting on him. But in the meantime, we always have <laughs> weeds to pull. <laughs> the temperature felt good today. Yes, Winston. This was definitely better than my quick fix. <laughs> True, Thomas. <laughs> The project was a success. Mm. But we needed to be patient. Mm. I guess it was worth the wait. You know, Winston, ever since I've known you, you've always been so patient. So come on then, what's your secret? <laughs> a lot of practice. Really? I imagined you were always this way. I can assure you, that is not the case. Tell me more. <laughs> well, here's the thing about patience. Well, wasn't that a happy ending? We were just watching a three and a half minute dramatization shown to Jehovah's Witnesses on the Friday afternoon session of their convention. The theme of the item, imitate the patience of Jesus. And this three and a half minute dramatization its apparent message is to remind Jehovah's Witnesses to be patient and to wait on the organization to care for their every need. In this case, their need for a new AC system in their kingdom hall. 
But it was painful to watch, wasn't it? Maybe it's just me, but it was such an uninteresting story. The acting was terrible. The plot was dull and mundane. And you're, you're scratching your head thinking, why does this even matter? Why devote resources to this? Why make this particular story the subject of a high production dramatization, albeit a three and a half minute one? I don't know. Again, for me, it feels like they're running out of things to talk about. <laughs> they've they've covered life as a Jehovah's Witness from every conceivable angle, from elder infighting to teenagers wanting to wear ripped jeans. <laughs> they've covered everything at this point, and it seems the one last box they needed to check was how to deal with an impatient elder who wants to take it upon himself to fix the Kingdom Hall's air conditioning. Greenwood was a thriving black community in Tulsa, Oklahoma, with many professionals, including attorney and newspaper columnist Richard J. Hill, a zealous servant of Jehovah. In May of 1921, Tulsa, Oklahoma became the site of one of the worst race massacres in United States history. Hundreds of armed men invaded Greenwood. They beat and killed many black citizens. It was a massacre. Arthur Klaus was another faithful brother there in Tulsa. When he heard about the violence, he became very concerned about his good friend, Richard Hill, who was living in Greenwood. So Brother Klaus went to Brother Hill's home to check on him. But Brother Klaus found an armed neighbor protecting his home. He thought that Brother Klaus was another stranger coming there. Brother Klaus immediately identified himself. He explained that he was a friend of Richard Hill's and he was looking for him to try to help him. And that's when he was told that many of the black people in that area had been taken to the convention hall. So Brother Klaus headed back into downtown Tulsa. The National Guard had been called in and had placed General Barrett in charge and he decided that no black person could leave the convention hall without a signed order. So Brother Klaus patiently waited to see the general and explained that he just wanted to help his friend. After Brother Klaus agreed to be responsible for the family, the general signed the order. But then Brother Klaus had to walk through a mob of armed white men to get into the convention hall. It happened to be the same location that just two nights before, Judge Rutherford had delivered the talk, millions now living will never die. But Brother Klaus courageously walked up to the guard, handed him the sign order, and was let in. Now, the auditorium was filled with black people who must have been very puzzled to see a white man. But Brother Klaus calmly walked through the crowd, met Brother Hill and his family, and took them back to their home. In the auditorium, Brother Klaus overheard people say, now look at that. They're the only religious group to go to the general and get a release for their people. You know, we're in the wrong religion, I'm thinking. Brother Klaus showed patience and discernment, and he was able to help a brother in danger. And in his weekly newspaper column, Brother Hill continued to echo the message of Brother Rutherford's talk that God's kingdom is the solution to all of the world's problems, including mob violence. We've just been watching a video segment that's being shown to Jehovah's Witnesses as part of their Exercise Patience Convention. This particular video is shown during the Friday afternoon symposium, Imitate Those Who Inherit the Promises through patience, and the specific talk in which this segment is shown has the sub-theme Mordecai and Esther. I guess my problem with this video segment is it represents historical re revisionism, essentially, which is something that Jehovah's Witness propaganda routinely does. It's right that Jehovah's Witnesses should be shining a light on 
racial inequality and racial injustice. And in this case, a massacre that happened in Oklahoma that claimed the lives of dozens of black people. The problem with Jehovah's Witnesses specifically doing this and going back into the 20th century, the early 20th century, and again, shining a light on this issue, is that they themselves have a very dubious track record on race the further back you go in their history. And what's interesting is Jehovah's Witnesses are kind of dissuaded from studying their own history. If you go on the website, jw.org, and you go to the Watchtower Online Library, there's only so far back you can go in the publications. You can only go as far back as the 1950s when it comes to the Watchtower articles, the Watchtower magazine, and the 1970s when it comes to the Awake even though we know for a fact that Bethel elders are able to use the same piece of software, Watchtower Online Library, to access publications going all the way back to the 19th century and the writings of Charles Taze Russell. So what this means is Jehovah's Witnesses are being shielded from their own publications past a certain date. And part of it is because, again, the further back you go, the more questions get raised. One example that has nothing to do with race is mentioned in this very video segment. It happened to be the same location that just two nights before Judge Rutherford had delivered the talk, millions now living will never die. Only two nights before, Judge Rutherford, Joseph Franklin Rutherford, then president of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania, had given a talk at this convention center that became the focus of this dark moment in American history, this shameful episode. Rutherford had given a talk there with the theme, Millions Now Living Will Never Die. And we're talking about 1921. We're now in 2023. So we're talking about something that happened 102 years ago. And an early Watchtower leader, and in fact, arguably the first or one of the first members of the faithful and discreet slave, if you take your belief seriously as a Jehovah's Witness, is touring around, giving a talk with the theme, millions now living, now living in 1921, will never die. That, I think we can safely say, was a false prediction. So Rutherford was a charlatan, just based purely on that brief clip that we've seen in this video that's being seen by millions of Jehovah's Witnesses. But it's glossed over. You're not supposed to focus on that. They have to mention that Rutherford gave a talk at this venue because it's kind of a key part of the story from a Jehovah's Witness perspective. But let's face it, the title of that talk has not aged well at all. And we do well to ask, or Jehovah's Witnesses would do well to ask, where was God's direction in this particular chain of events that became so notorious in American history? If Tibor is gracious, we're going to take a look at two photographs that were taken at the time showing Judge Rutherford's face plastered on the entrance to this convention venue. And again, this location is now notorious as being a focal point for bigotry. Where was Jehovah's hand? I mean, you can't really blame Rutherford. It wasn't really his fault that when all of this happened, his poster was still there on the front of the building. But you'd think 
if the organization was being directed by God and if, if God really was interested in the outworking of his purpose with re regard to this particular group of people, you'd think God would make it so that Rutherford's face wasn't plastered across the front of this particular building when all of this was happening and when black people were being incarcerated purely due to their skin colour. And this brings me to the second part of the video that irritated me, which we see towards the end. And in his weekly newspaper column, Brother Hill continued to echo the message of Brother Rutherford's talk that God's kingdom is the solution to all of the world's problems, including mob violence. Including mob violence. So the message we're getting right at the end is that if only the residents in Tulsa, Oklahoma had listened to Rutherford, none of this would have happened. Rutherford's message was apparently the answer all along because he was against mob violence. What it doesn't say is that Rutherford was against racism. And that would have been a very simple thing to put in there, wouldn't it? Imagine what a powerful statement that would be in this video, in the context of what happened during this dreadful atrocity. Imagine how powerful it would have been if Jehovah's Witnesses could have said right at the end, you know what? Rutherford had been at that very convention center speaking out against racism. They can't say that because Rutherford didn't speak out against racism. If anything, he was in favor of it. And if you don't believe me, let's go to the 1929 Golden Age. Bear in mind, the Golden Age ended up becoming first the Consolation and then the Awake. So straight away we're seeing why the Awake only goes as far back as the 1970s. If it were to go further back, into, let's say, the 1920s or the 1930s, perhaps Jehovah's Witnesses might be shocked at some of the things that were said during that era in Jehovah's organization, some of the things that the faithful and discreet slave, which apparently had been appointed only a couple of years before the Tulsa massacre in 1919, some of the things that the faithful and discreet slave themselves were publishing in their magazines. The 1929 Golden Age said the following. I apologize in advance because this is grotesque. This is hideous language, but it's from the spiritual food that was being published by the Watchtower organization at that time. It is generally believed that the curse which Noah pronounced upon Canaan was the origin of the black race. Certain it is that when Noah said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren, he pictured the future of the coloured race. They have been and are a race of servants. But now in the dawn of the 20th century, we are all coming to see this matter of service in its true light and to find that the only real joy in life is in serving others, not bossing them. There is no servant in the world as good as a good coloured servant. And the joy that he gets from rendering faithful service is one of the purest joys there is in the world. We can't be certain that Joseph Rutherford penned these awful words, but he certainly presided over the organization when they were published in the Golden Age, which was a magazine that he launched and that he was an editor of. More than likely, it was one of Rutherford's underlings that wrote this particular piece of bile. But it happened under Rutherford's watch. It happened during the era of the faithful and discreet slave, which began, again, only two years prior to the Tulsa massacre in 1919. And in fact, these words were published 
in the golden age, 10 years after the faithful and discreet slave were apparently appointed. Food for thought if you are one of Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm pleased to present Rene and Irma Pagan from the Central Poughkeepsie Congregation. Rene and Irma, you raised two sons who are as strong and zealous in the truth. So let me ask you, why and how did you encourage your children to pursue spiritual goals? In Psalms 127, verse 3, they mentions how sons are blessings to Jehovah. We remember young Samuel and Timothy. We wanted our boys to experience the same blessings as they did. From the very beginning, we encouraged them to pick up full-time service. We helped them to appreciate they did. We would help them financially. We also knew that good association was vital. And so we invited family members of Bethel to our home every weekend. And we also took and were able to take them to Bethel. And they also came to appreciate meeting members of the governing body. And we never missed a meeting. I personally wanted my sons to uh, understand that serving Jehovah is the best way. And that putting any other pursuit ahead first is ahead of Jehovah's service was in vain. So I started pioneering as soon as they went to school. Mm, congratulations. We're deeply grateful to see our two sons get baptized and later pioneer. Later they both became elders and they both served at Bethel. Irma and I are still in the full-time work and we thank your God every day for his blessings. We have no greater joy, Brother Bell, that seeing both our sons remain faithful serving in, the, in their service to Jehovah. Very good. I believe that. Thank you very much, Renee and Irma, for your good example and for sharing your experience with all of us. So that's it, right? The kids are raised and out of the house. Mission accomplished. Far from it. Renee and Irma have continued to be an inspiration to their own children and to many others. They too became pioneers. They later entered the circuit work and they now serve as special pioneers. We cannot all do what Renee and Irma have done. Circumstances vary, age and illness take their toll. But our righteous God never forgets the love we have shown and continue to show for his name. Rather than urging their children to seek financial and material security in Satan's world, raise them in the words of 1 Timothy 6.17 to place their hope not on uncertain riches, but on God. Encourage them to take up full-time service and to patiently await their real life under God's kingdom. Yes, because it's not the real life now, is it, Brother Bell? <laughs> This life that we're living now is some kind of fake, some kind of illusion. And the real life, of course, awaits us after Armageddon, after billions have been slaughtered. So we are watching the symposium piece imitate those who inherit the promises through patience, Zechariah and Elizabeth, this on the Friday afternoon session. And it's Dan Bell a Bethelite from Warwick, New York, of course, the headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses. He's interviewing there Rene and Irma, who we later find out are actually special pioneers. So they're not just kind of ordinary, relatable, rank-and-file Jehovah's Witnesses. They're choosing, really, the cream of the crop, and they're picking a story to show Jehovah's Witness parents what the expectations are. And all I would say is, how can you really claim that all of this is optional, all of this is a free choice when it comes to pioneering, committing 50 hours per month of your time for free to the organization, or serving for free in some other capacity as a Bethelite, which is also mentioned there. How can you claim that all of this is optional, something that Jehovah's Witness youths can choose to do freely, when, as we've just heard, they're being pressured by their parents to pursue these things practically from when they first emerge from the womb? 
Brother Jean Mancoca is one of many of Jehovah's Witnesses in Angola who faced cruel persecution because of their faith. And during the decades of the 1940s until the 1970s, Brother Mancoca endured prison, penal colonies, and much torture, as well as separation from his family. Despite this, he never stopped strengthening himself and others. My father, Adao Agostinho, was arrested in the early 1970s. And in prison, who did he find? Brother Mancoca and other brothers who also had faced cruel persecution for a long time. Brother Mancoca was a mentor to my father. So, every night, he would go by Brother Mancoca's bed and ask him many questions about the Bible. In his memoirs, my father wrote something very interesting. He was very patient with me. I took with me a wealth of knowledge that helped me in the trials that followed. Today, I cannot imagine what my life would be like without this inheritance that was passed down by those loyal brothers. My father, Sylvester Simao, and brother Joao Mancoca served together on the Angola branch committee, but that was not where they met. When my father attended his first meeting as a Bible student, brother Mancoca was conducting the Watchtower study. Suddenly, the meeting place was raided, and brother Mancoca became concerned because a good number of those in attendance were Bible students, including my father. Brother Mancoca asked that they release the students, but that did not happen. They beat them up. They beat them up brutally, all the men that were there. In fact, my dad said he thought that he was going to die on that day because the beating was so brutal and he lost a lot of blood. In the face of this situation, Brother Mancoca was concerned. He said a sincere prayer for Jehovah to protect his sheep. And that was what happened. Jehovah protected them. My dad could see that Brother Mancoca was more concerned with them than he was with himself. Brother Mancoca also had the opportunity to help others to get to know the truth. And one of them is my uncle, Philip Cunha. He was in that jail as a political prisoner, and he learned the truth there. And as a result, four generations of our family today are Jehovah's Witnesses. The situation of Brother Mancoca and other brothers who faced persecution here in Angola proves that with Jehovah's help, we can face persecution. When a person does not have patience, he cannot persevere because he's looking at the time when the trial will end. On the other hand, patience helped the brothers to deal with trials, focusing on what they could do and on Jehovah's help. It wouldn't be a convention without this sort of video, would it? So we've just been watching a video segment from the Friday afternoon session of the Exercise Patience Convention. Part of the symposium, imitate those who inherit the promises through patience. And this video gets shown in the final item in the symposium, which is discussing Paul. And you can see the general gist of the talk is to talk about persecution and the fact that Jehovah's Witnesses are being persecuted. This is a common trope that gets brought in in every convention program, really, at some point, where Jehovah's Witnesses are reminded of the persecution they're either experiencing now or can expect to experience in the future or have experienced in the past. And to be clear... I am firmly against Jehovah's Witnesses or, frankly, any religious group or religious minority being persecuted for what's going on in their heads. I think it's appalling and thuggish for governments to round people up and, in this case, beat people just because of an ideological difference. You do not police what's going on in someone's head. That said, I cannot help but find material such as this exploitative 
and frankly intended as propaganda. And it also is a little bit two-faced because, for example, we heard the following. Brother Mancoca endured prison, penal colonies, and much torture, as well as separation from his family. Separation from his family. That's what Brother Mancoca had to deal with. Stings a little bit that, doesn't it? If you're on the receiving end of shunning as someone who was perhaps raised in the Jehovah's Witness group or joined the Jehovah's Witness group at any point and later decided that you no longer believed. Or if you found yourself transgressing one of the many, many things that Jehovah's Witnesses have decided are sinful, whether it's smoking cigarettes, taking up professional boxing, having consenting sex with another adult, or, I don't know, accepting a life-saving blood transfusion. These are all things that can lead to shunning, separation from your family. It seems it's wrong to separate someone from their loved ones, from their family, if it's in the context of Jehovah's Witnesses being persecuted, but it's totally acceptable, apparently, for Jehovah's Witnesses to do this to others or to do this to essentially their own followers or followers who stray in any form. And then later on, you get this odd part of the story where we hear the following. In the face of this situation, Brother Mankoka was concerned. He said a sincere prayer for Jehovah to protect his ship. And that was what happened. Jehovah protected them. Jehovah protected them. So Brother Menkoka, all he had to do was say a prayer when his fellow witnesses were being brutally beaten. Their meeting was interrupted. The police showed up or whoever, soldiers, and just started beating the crap out of people. And he was rightly concerned, Brother Menkoka, but who knew he had this special power where all he needed to do was say a prayer to Jehovah and it stopped. This raises way more questions for me because you then have to ask the question, what about Jehovah's Witnesses who've been persecuted in the past who have died? And in the context of Africa, you know where I'm going with this, all we need to do is look to Malawi, and I've done a video on the betrayal that happened in Malawi. Thumbnail here if Tibor is gracious. What about all of the Jehovah's Witness men and women? I'm thinking particularly women and the way they were treated and the sexual violence that was carried out towards them. Where was Jehovah then? Was it simply a case of Brother Menkoka not being around to say a prayer for them? In the following video, we're going to observe some plants and draw a lesson about responding to our environment in the right way and at the right time. Let's watch the video. These are seeds. You may not know this, but seeds turn into plants. They're also nice in salads or certain types of muesli. When I was a boy, I perfected the art of caring for plants so that today I'm the proud owner of a healthy crop of cannabis. I once tried growing cannabis in Alaska, but I lost my entire crop because it was too freaking cold. I did manage to grow some nice flowers, but frankly, the constant bear attacks meant it wasn't worth it. You'd think deserts would be a better place for growing some nice pot, but you'd be wrong. It's hot as hell out there. I mean, it does rain sometimes, but let's face it, a desert is a boring place to hang around, and apparently in the future there will be no deserts, so you're better off growing your weed in a greenhouse or something similar. 
Of course, if oil is your thing, you could always grow sunflowers instead. Sunflower oil can be used to fry things or as a makeshift lubricant. You can also use the seeds in salads or feed them to pigeons and other birds. Of course, if you can't be bothered growing weed or sunflowers, there are other ways to spend your time. You can watch TV, play chess, become an astronaut, or join a cult. Jehovah's Witnesses are a great cult to join if you relish the idea of billions dying in an impending apocalypse, or if you like bothering your neighbours by knocking on their doors. Speaking of doors, here's an obscure door-related Bible verse. Likewise, also you, when you see all these things, know that he is near at the doors. Ooh. I couldn't resist having a bit of fun with that one. So we've just been watching a video, well, an edited version of a video that's shown as part of the symposium, the Friday afternoon symposium, what creation can teach us about Jehovah's timing, in this case, plants. And when I was doing my prep for this rebuttal, I mean, they have five of these videos. And it's typical for this part of the convention for the organization to have these sort of creation videos where they use stock footage of either animals or plants or scenery or some other aspect of Jehovah's creation. And they twist it in some way to make it all about either recognizing Jehovah's authority or serving Jehovah acceptably, you name it. And I was, <laughs> for this year's rebuttal, I was watching these videos thinking, I can't just show the video, which is so infantilizing and patronizing and condescending in just passing on information that we all already know. I've got to make it a little bit more interesting. So for each of the five videos, just as a heads up, I have redubbed them with my own narration. And I hope you find the narration that I've come up with a little bit more entertaining. For the purposes of journalistic integrity, I will, however, for each of the videos, tell you what gets said in the original video. So here's what you missed out on. We can watch a tiny seed transform into a beautiful plant. But what part do timing and surrounding conditions play in plant growth? During the cold season, seeds and bulbs remain dormant. Later, as temperatures rise and the days lengthen, they bloom. Some desert plants practically shut down during long dry periods. When it finally rains, it's their time to grow and flower. Sunflower plants need lots of light. Throughout the day, they turn to follow the sun. After their flowers open, they stop moving and face east all day. Jehovah made plants to respond to their environment at the right time. We respond to evidence that these are the last days and we focus on the source of spiritual light. Jesus said, likewise, also you, when you see all these things, know that he is near at the doors. So they can't do something as simple as talk about plants without giving it a doomsday spin. Certain plants time their cycles according to their environments, therefore Armageddon is coming and we all need to be on the lookout. That's essentially the message of the video. And I hope you all don't mind if I had a little bit of fun and noted the fact that among the many plants God has created, are plants such as cannabis, which Jehovah's Witnesses will be disfellowshipped for taking into their bodies unless it's as medicine. And we also have this weird anomaly of Jehovah creating certain plants to be in a desert environment and to shut down for long periods when there is no water. So my question would be, when there are no more deserts, because apparently Jehovah's going to do away with deserts in the paradise, what happens to all of these plants that he has specifically created for a desert environment? The fig tree. 
responds to its environment. As the weather starts to warm, it puts forth bright green leaves. And Jesus said that someone seeing those leaves would know that summer is near. And in the future, when Jesus' disciples would see the fulfillment of the sign he gave, they would know that he was present in kingdom power and that the end of the system of things was near. What about us? What do we see now? Well, it's interesting that for centuries, Jesus' disciples had to be patient. They had to watch and wait for the sign. But we are in a different situation. The time for waiting is past because we see every aspect of the sign being fulfilled. Wars, famine, disease, all on an unprecedented global scale. And we see people's selfish, unloving, often violent attitudes and behavior. And these were also foretold in the Bible as a sign of the last days. There is no doubt we are living in the last days. So how should we respond to our environment? Now is not the time to be dormant like a tree in winter. Now is the time for us to be active and ready for this system's end. Yeah, I hate to break it to you, but this system is ending. The world as we know it is ending. And it's the time for us to all be ready. And of course, the only way to be ready is to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses, like Keith Codwell, the uh, speaker here who is from the Warwick, New York, Bethel. He's taking us through the symposium item, What Creation Can Teach Us About Jehovah's Timing Plants. I absolutely loved it when we got the following soundbite. But we are in a different situation. The time for waiting is past because we see every aspect of the sign being fulfilled. The time for waiting is past. So <laughs> Jehovah's Witnesses, if you think about it, don't even need to exercise patience. <laughs> Why do you need patience if you're not waiting? The waiting's all been done, apparently, by past centuries, past generations of Christians, even since before Jehovah's Witnesses, going all the way back to the time of Christ and the apostles. They were the ones who had to wait. Jehovah's Witnesses nowadays don't need to wait anymore because we have the sign. And of course... Keith goes on to talk about wars and pestilences, famine, you name it. I've actually already debunked this whole sign of the last days thing in sushi number, I think it's 432, thumbnail here if Tibor is gracious, which he always is. Jeffrey Jackson's last day's password argument debunked. I think it was 24, was it? 24 um, elements of the sign that Jeffrey Jackson alluded to in this talk. And what's interesting is if you go through each and every one of them, you find that they're all things that could have happened or could be said to have happened at any point in human history. Even in many cases, things that were happening on a worse scale in past epochs of human history. I'm thinking specifically of pandemics. I mean, we can talk about COVID and how many millions of lives that has tragically taken. And that's very fresh in our minds. But I would argue that's nothing compared to the carnage and death that resulted from diseases like smallpox, which have been eradicated thanks to human science and progress with medicine. So 
again, for any one of these elements of the sign that Jehovah's Witnesses jump up and down about, you could argue that there is nothing unique about the time in which we're living. If anything, we are living in a time now where, sure, there are problems that we have to contend with and constant challenges and Things can go wrong at any moment. Things can get worse at any moment. But by and large, I think we can all agree that we would rather be living now than, say, two or three hundred years ago. You know, <laughs> the quality of life, the levels of literacy, you know, the access to health care, the access to clean water, you know, the political and civil unrest compared to, say, living in feudal Europe <laughs> or being constantly beset by rampaging armies who were, you know, pillaging and, you know, Vikings ransacking your village and all that kind of thing. I think we can all objectively agree that we'd rather be living now. Thank you very much. So enough with all of this doomsday rhetoric which is a staple of these conventions but unfortunately that's not how you're programmed to think as one of jehovah's witnesses and keith codwell knows this full well he is playing upon the fears and paranoias that are coded into jehovah's witness ideology jesus was indicating that despite the abundant evidence some among his disciples would find it a challenge to maintain their focus during the last days. They would become distracted and weighed down. The Watchtower said about these verses, some among God's people are getting sidetracked. This can be seen in the decisions they make about secular work, higher education, the acquisition of material possessions, as well as the amount of time spent in sports and entertainment. Well, these comments in the Watchtower are a timely warning, aren't they? And we all do well to examine ourselves. But it is heartwarming to see that the vast majority of Jehovah's people are focused and they are using the limited amount of time remaining in this system of things to work hard and to help others come to know Jehovah and gain life. We are living at a never-to-be-repeated time. And even though these are difficult last days, there is so much joy and contentment to be found in serving Jehovah and in helping others to serve Jehovah by living in harmony with Jehovah's timing. And ultimately, doing so will be life-saving. So learn the lesson of the fig tree. Stay alert to world conditions and act wisely, knowing that the end of this system of things is near at hand. The end of this system is near at hand, and acting wisely as one of Jehovah's Witnesses could be life-saving. Do I even need to explain or, or point out that this is apocalyptic doomsday fear-mongering? This is the Jehovah's Witness cult, if we can use that word, this is Jehovah's Witnesses in a nutshell. It's all about fear. It's all about whipping up paranoia. And again, my question would be, as I've said so many times on this channel, and I apologize if I'm repeating myself, but why can't they be upfront with people about all this when they're on your doorstep or when people approach them at the carts? Why don't they tell people who walk up to them in the street that being a Jehovah's Witness involves losing your freedom to make decisions in such areas as secular work, higher education, the acquisition of things, which things you buy, 
and how much time you spend in sports and entertainment. Some among God's people are getting sidetracked. This can be seen in the decisions they make about secular work, higher education, the acquisition of material possessions, as well as the amount of time spent in sports and entertainment. When are they going to start being upfront about all this? I, I think people de deserve to know, they deserve to be dignified with the knowledge that when you become a Jehovah's Witness, your life isn't really your own. There are certain elements of your life in which you will be micromanaged or you will be shamed or made to feel guilty if you make the wrong decision when it comes to such things as what you own, what things you spend your money on. Apparently Stephen Lett can spend his money on whatever he likes, <laughs> including going halves on a $500,000 property in Florida, thumbnail here if Tibor is gracious. He can spend his money on whatever he likes. But when you're a rank and file member of the religion, if you get so much as a flat screen that's the wrong dimensions, you can expect to get some side eye from others in the congregation. You can expect to feel shamed if you spend too much time in sports or entertainment. Things that we quite frankly need. I mean... The whole Jehovah's Witness mindset seems to be that every waking hour needs to be accounted for either in worshipping as a Jehovah's Witness or putting bread on the table or doing something practical. There can be no time for just fun or, or for just, you know, relaxing and just enjoying life a little bit because this isn't the real life as we've already heard in this session of the convention this is just some kind of mirage that we're caught up in and we need to be investing everything that we have into supporting the organization an organization that believes that becoming a member is an existential issue and they are using the limited amount of time remaining in this system of things to work hard and to help others come to know Jehovah and gain life. Gain life. In other words, not die. <laughs> That's what's at stake. Why can't they be upfront about this? Why can't they say to people who approach them in the street, you know what? This is actually a big deal. It's not just about learning more about the Bible. It's not just about studying the Bible with us. This is about gaining life. This is about you not dying at an impending apocalypse. In the following video, please note what we can learn from Jehovah's timing from the way he created sea creatures to behave. Let's watch the video. Let's talk about fish and other things that swim in the sea. Salmon are a type of fish that I find particularly tasty. Most salmon start life in fresh water and then hightail it out of that river situation. I mean, to be fair, they're young, they're weak, and the flow of the river is going to dump them in the sea sooner or later. Once they're out in the open ocean, the salmon hit puberty and get all frisky. One thing leads to another, and before you know it, they're heading back up the river to spawn, by which point they're knackered. And that is how the salmon do. Not to be confused with salmon or penguins are these fellas, dolphins. Dolphins are experts at leaping out of the water in a way that looks cool. 
They've also perfected the art of catching fish without needing any nets or fishing rods. But not everyone loves dolphins. Sharks despise them, mostly because all that adorable jumping and leaping and not eating people has given dolphins awesome PR. When Shizzle gets Rizzle and a shark gets all up in the dolphin's business, dolphins gang together and throw shade at the shark until it f***s off. Not dissimilar to sharks are cult followers, even the ones that sit around eating snacks looking pretty harmless. They may not want to eat you, but they definitely want to make you feel like you need salvation and you need it now, typically by using Bible verses like this. Look, now is the especially acceptable time. Look, now is the day of salvation. So yes, again, just to be clear, this is not quite the video Jehovah's Witnesses are being shown on the Friday afternoon of their exercise patience convention. I have taken the liberty of narrating it myself because the original is really rather tedious. This video, by the way, is part of the symposium item, What Creation Can Teach Us About Jehovah's Timing Sea Creatures. And in this particular footage, we've just seen Christopher Ovis from the Warwick, New York headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses. Just for the purpose of journalistic integrity, allow me again to just go through what the original narration was, just so you can see why I thought it necessary <laughs> to make it a little bit more fun and interesting. So originally what you would have heard is as follows. Sea creatures, do they benefit from acting at the right time? These are young salmon. They start life in fresh water. Most species migrate downriver to the ocean to feed and grow. They time the trip around the currents and available food. Later as adults, they're ready to head back and start the next generation. They wait until river conditions are suitable to migrate upriver. Then they go. <laughs> Dolphins, too, perform different activities at different times. There's time to play, to see what's for dinner, and to make friends. But there are times when a dolphin knows to act with urgency. When threatened, the dolphin pod closes ranks to protect everyone, especially the young. We stay close to one another for safety in a spiritually dangerous world. And no matter how busy we are, we make time to be taught by Jehovah. Look, now is the especially acceptable time, etc. So even just a video about salmon <laughs> and dolphins, they can twist it, they being the Jehovah's Witness leadership, the faithful and discreet slave or governing body, they can twist it and give it an apocalyptic feel. And they can make it all about closing ranks and being under siege. I, I feel almost as though the shark part of the video, the shark is practically apostates, isn't it? Or you can imagine that's what they want Jehovah's Witnesses to, that's the connection they want Jehovah's Witnesses to make when they're watching. We need to be on the lookout for people who would wreck our faith spiritually and like dolphins, we need to act with urgency <laughs> and we need to close ranks and protect ourselves. But how hypocritical for them to single out the young. They say in the original, when threatened, the dolphin pod closes ranks to protect everyone, especially the young. I'll take this sort of rhetoric from just about any organisation, but I certainly won't take it from the Jehovah's Witness organization in which child sexual abuse is rampant because they don't take seriously their responsibility to protect the young. We know now that it's in their documented policies to put the organization first and throw children under the bus by allowing child predators and their horrendous crimes against children to be covered up. Just like the dolphin in the video who adjust quickly to their environment, we too learn to adjust quickly 
to our preaching methods and disciple-making work with changing circumstances in changing world situations. We have seen and experienced this during the pandemic. The question is, why are we so successful in adapting? Because of your faith, our faith. By faith, we fully cooperate with any changes as we serve loyally to the head of the Christian congregation, Jesus Christ, and the appointed faithful and discreet slave of Jehovah. The faithful and discreet slave is the primary channel of Jehovah for dispensing increased light or understanding of Jehovah's time and seasons today. We understand that we need to keep pace with God's organization and keep up with new understanding of Bible truths, neither running ahead or falling behind from the one whom Jehovah instructed that light, the faithful slave. Let's read together Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18. Here it says, But the path of the righteous is like the bright morning light that grows brighter and brighter until full daylight. Proverbs 4.18 makes it clear that accurate knowledge increases with time. Jehovah reveals the truth gradually, and we must be willing to wait patiently so that for the light of truth to get brighter and for us to fully understand Jehovah's thinking. Yes, it's all about understanding Jehovah's thinking, not just the thinking of the governing body, but Jehovah's thinking. We've just been hearing from Christopher Ovis, who is a Bethelite from the Warwick, New York headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses. He's just been making some very interesting comments about the governing body. Apparently, it's not just about keeping in step with their direction, it's not just about observing their instruction and being obedient to them. Apparently, Jehovah's Witnesses also need to serve them. By faith, we fully cooperate with any changes as we serve loyally to the head of the Christian congregation, Jesus Christ, and the appointed faithful and discreet slave of Jehovah. We serve loyally to Jesus Christ and the faithful and discreet slave of Jehovah. I'm going to try to be charitable here <laughs> because if I had to guess, English is not the first language of Christopher, who's the Bethelite that's making these comments. It could be that something's getting a little bit lost in translation. It could be that he isn't expressing himself as clearly as he would like or perhaps as clearly as the organization would like. But we have to go, I think, on what's being said here. And he hasn't just spoken about, again, being respectful of the governing body, recognizing them as God's channel, etc. He's outright called upon Jehovah's Witnesses to serve the governing body, just as they would serve Jesus. That's more than a bit chilling. And to back up his statement, he reads from Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18, from which he makes the following conclusions. Proverbs 4, 18 makes it clear that accurate knowledge increases with time. Jehovah reveals the truth gradually, and we must be willing to wait patiently. Proverbs 4 verse 18 makes it clear, apparently, that accurate knowledge increases with time. That's what Proverbs 4 verse 18 says. Does it now, Christopher? Why don't we read it in context? Let's start from Proverbs 4 verse 14. Do not enter the path of the wicked and do not walk in the way of evil men. Shun it. Do not take it. Turn away from it and pass it by, for they cannot sleep unless they do what is bad. They are robbed of sleep unless they cause someone's downfall. They feed themselves with the bread of wickedness and they drink the wine of violence. 
but the path of the righteous is like the bright morning light that grows brighter and brighter until full daylight. The way of the wicked is like the darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. That's all Proverbs 4 verse 18 says. It says nothing about knowledge increasing. It's comparing wicked people with good people and saying that the way of wicked people is dark and bad and the way of righteous people is bright and good. That's all it's saying. I'm going to talk more about New Light as we allow this talk to progress, but I think it's worth just flagging. If you are watching this as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, a Jehovah's Witness speaker at a convention has just read a Bible verse to you and drawn a completely wrong conclusion, a completely misleading conclusion about what it means. And not only that, he's made it abundantly clear that he wants you to not just follow the governing body, but serve them. When the faithful slave or the governing body realizes that our understanding of certain points of truths needs to be clarified, they do not hesitate to make the needed adjustment. While many denominations of Christendom today make changes to please their church's members and get closer to the world's points of view, the changes made by Jehovah's organization are designed to draw us closer to God and to the pattern of worship established by Jesus Christ. The adjustments we make are driven not by popular demands, not by modern trends, but by the clearer understanding of the scriptures. How should we react if such adjustment is presented to us? We can keep in mind or take to heart the words of Apostle Paul found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12. Let's turn our Bible to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12. And this is what Paul reminded us. Now we request you, brothers, to show respect for those who are working hard among you and presiding over you in the Lord and admonishing you. Yes, we are always ready to accept organizational adjustments and cooperate with direction from the governing body. At the end of the system of things, our survival may depend on taking timely action. May we always act in harmony with a great timekeeper, Jehovah God. Because again, your survival may depend on it. We've just been hearing from Christopher Ovis, who is a Bethelite at the Warwick, New York headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses. He is speaking on the Friday afternoon of the Exercise Patience Convention. And he's giving Jehovah's Witnesses a 101, really, on the New Light teaching, or at least the Jehovah's Witness angle on the New Light teaching. I don't want to go into this in too much detail because I've already debunked everything that Christopher has just said in this video about New Light, which I put out quite some time ago, in which I give actual examples showing how haphazard and makeshift and, frankly, human the whole new light process is when it comes to arriving at new understandings of Scripture. Off the top of my head, I'm thinking of one adjustment they made around about 2019 when David Splane announced that they'd come to a new understanding of the prophetic meaning of locusts in Joel compared to Revelation. Because prior to that point, it had been assumed that the locusts that both books were referring to were the same. And he went to great lengths to explain that actually they're different locusts. The ones in Joel are bad and the ones in Revelation are good. And the reason, the reason why the governing body as late as just a few years ago, had arrived at this epiphany is because 
they'd suddenly learned to read the Bible in context. That was the reason. Oh, well, when we consider the context of this Bible verse, we realize that it's not talking about the same locusts. It's taken you that long to do something as simple as read the Bible in context. And when Christopher is talking here about the governing body not hesitating to introduce new light once they arrive at a scriptural understanding, again, the history of the organization is laden with examples that contradict this. How do you explain, if it's all about taking urgent action to correct something, how do you explain flip-flops? How do you explain instances where the organization has gone from doing something to deciding that that thing is terrible and then going back to doing that thing that they were doing to begin with, such as the elder arrangement, Charles Taze Russell, had an elder arrangement when he was presiding over the Watchtower Society. His successor, Joseph Rutherford, comes along and decides that elders are terrible and evil. He writes Watchtower article after Watchtower article, book after book, explaining how elected elders are this terrible, terrible thing and they're out to deceive God's people or stop them from preaching. And as a result, the elder arrangement, it doesn't get reformed, it gets completely disbanded so that you have just a congregation servant, just one man in each congregation who takes the role of shepherding or leading the congregation. And then in the Nathan Nor era, they go back to having elders. It's a flip-flop. It's, it's, it's an entirely human process there's nothing divine there's there's no inspiration in that they've just changed their minds they've they've gone with the winds of change that their organization like any religious organization has been subjected to so if you are one of jehovah's witnesses again check out that new light video but just watch this talk you know watch this sushi and the sushi before and you'll see that Christopher's argumentation about new light is all over the place. In reality, coming up with new understandings of scripture and constantly changing your mind about what the Bible has to say is an evidence that you are a man-made organization and you're just making it up as you go along. Well, in the following video, notice what we can learn about timing from the way Jehovah created a different bird to behave. I can't speak for all birds. I mean, there are loads of them. There are eagles, geese, hummingbirds. Don't even get me started on frickin' owls. But I know for damn sure emperor penguins don't appreciate being called different. I mean, sure, these chaps can't fly and they're not even fast walkers. To be honest, they walk like they're trying to hide that they've just had an accident, if you know what I mean. But penguins are a legit species of bird and they will frickin' end you if you give them any lip just because they don't fall neatly into the stereotypical bird cliché. Frankly, these dudes need our respect, especially if you consider what they went through about four and a half thousand years ago when God flooded the entire planet just to kill all but one family of humans. Why don't you try trekking seven and a half thousand miles from Antarctica to the Middle East? swimming across the Atlantic Ocean and then making it on foot across Africa, including the Sahara Desert, all the while waddling along as though you're holding in a big fat steamer. These homies went through all of that just to spend a few months in a giant floating wooden box, and it's not like they could just get an Uber back. Emperor penguins are badass, and if you ask me, they deserve mad respect.
If you try to pick one up and they're not in the mood, take it from me, you will live to regret it. Possibly the most awesome thing about penguins is their wisdom in choosing a place to live that's so frickin' cold that they're almost never bothered by people like this dude, a Jehovah's Witness. I'll take months of dragging my ass across a giant lump of frozen rock any day if it means I can keep control of my own mind and not feel forced to find profound meaning in obscure Bible verses such as this. Even the stork in the sky knows its seasons. I mean, that's not even penguin related. Okay, yeah, so once again, I just couldn't resist redubbing a Jehovah's Witness creation video. They put these, unfortunately, in every convention every year. There's some kind of video where they piece together stock footage of nature be it animals or geographical formations or weather, you name it. And they put an obscure Bible text at the end. And to be honest, I'm bored of just showing you these clips unedited and then finding something interesting to say. I'd rather just <laughs> add my own commentary and just spice things up a little bit. By the way, this is a symposium item, What Creation Can Teach Us About Jehovah's Timing, Birds. And the chap you saw at the beginning was Jason Goodman from the Warwick, New York headquarters. And just for the purpose of journalistic integrity, I'm going to read you the original narration just so you know what they were saying. Jehovah gave birds inherent abilities that enable them to survive in challenging environments. Consider emperor penguins. How do these birds deal with their unique challenges? And what can we learn from their sense of timing? For many birds, the end of the Antarctic summer marks the start of a migration north to milder conditions. But emperor penguins instinctively do the opposite. They head south moving deeper into the cold to breed. Each female then lays a single egg, which is soon entrusted to the male for safekeeping. These sites are very inhospitable, but the emperors are prepared. Jehovah has given them instinctive wisdom. Before migrating south, these males had feasted and built up their fat reserves. Apparently that's something Jehovah's Witnesses need to do, build up their fat reserves. Because for two long months, the coldest and darkest of the year, they won't eat and will lose half their body weight while they incubate the eggs. During this time, the females have trekked about 50 miles to the sea and are now ready to return with food just in time for when the chicks hatch. Preparing ahead for the difficult times helps these penguins to survive along with their young. Now is the time for us to learn from the emperor penguin and build up our spiritual reserves. Ah, it's a, the fat reserves are a metaphor. Build up our spiritual reserves before this world's dark days become even darker. Even the stalk in the sky knows its seasons. So they can't, again, make a video about something as harmless or as unthreatening or innocent as penguins without making it somehow ominous, somehow doomsday, somehow to do with Armageddon and everyone dying. We need to learn from the penguin and build up our spiritual reserves before this world's dark days become even darker. The end is coming. And in order to survive Armageddon, what Jehovah's Witnesses need to do is be more like penguins. But why is it so important for us to remain spiritually strong? When we're spiritually strong, we're in a better position to strengthen others, our brothers and sisters, and to help them build their faith. Hebrews 10.25 instructs us to meet together and to encourage one another, and all the more so as we behold Jehovah's Day drawing near. Just as the penguins huddled together for protection from the intense winds, we need to huddle together with our brothers and sisters for protection from Satan's system around us. That means we need to be where our brothers and sisters gather, at the meetings, attending in person if at all possible. 
then we can strengthen them by means of our comments and our conversations. When Jehovah's Day comes, we don't want to lose any one of our dear brothers or sisters because they got discouraged and gave up along the way. So right now is the time to encourage them. When we are spiritually strong, we'll also be in a position to build the faith of our family members. Did you notice that the penguins worked together to feed and protect their chicks so that they would survive the coming harsh winter? Uh, Parents, you can work together to feed and protect your children spiritually so that they survive Jehovah's coming day. How do you strengthen them spiritually? It's by spending time with them, reading the Bible with them, studying with them, praying with them, sharing in the ministry with them. And did you notice the good example in the video of the father who was conducting family worship? Family heads, your family worship program is essential to your family's survival. Soon, Jehovah's Day of Judgment will come. But we do not have to fear it if we are prepared. So may we all take a lesson from the birds. May we use the time we have left wisely to build up our own friendship with Jehovah, to build the faith of our family members and that of our close friends. Then when Jehovah's Day comes, we will be ready, happy that we used our time wisely while waiting. They're just not even trying anymore, are they? (laughs) They're just out in the open at this point when it comes to expressing how culty they are and how this is all about doomsday fear-mongering. I just wish they were this transparent with people when they were out on the street, standing next to their literature carts. We've just been hearing from Jason Goodman, who is a Bethelite at the Warwick, New York headquarters. He's taking us through the symposium item, What Creation Can Teach Us About Jehovah's Timing Birds. And if you're watching this as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, Just think for a moment about the last time you spoke to a member of the public or a householder and you were discussing Armageddon. You will have said something like, because I used to say this and I've heard Jehovah's Witnesses say this to me, you will have said something like, well, the solution to all of the injustice and misery and evil on our earth today is for God to execute wicked people. Once God destroys wicked people, then there will be no more evil and we can all be happy. And that's the logic that you use when you're preaching to people in the door-to-door work or in the public witnessing work. And yet, what did we just hear from Jason Goodman? When Jehovah's Day comes, we don't want to lose any one of our dear brothers or sisters because they got discouraged and gave up along the way. So right now is the time to encourage them. So Armageddon isn't just about killing people who are wicked or evil. Even some Jehovah's Witnesses will be slaughtered at Armageddon because they got discouraged and gave up along the way. That's going to be worthy of annihilation or execution when Armageddon comes. Imagine you're one of the angels or you're one of the 144,000 when Armageddon strikes and you're riding around (laughs) on your heavenly horse in the heavens with your heavenly bow and arrow or your heavenly sword or whatever heavenly instrument of death (laughs) you might be inclined to use maybe a heavenly ak-47 i don't know why does it have to be ancient weapons anyway you're riding around and you're killing evil people but along with the evil people you also have it as your mission to kill jehovah's witnesses who have gotten discouraged and given up along the way. It's your job to kill those two. And then we get to what Jason was saying about family worship. 
Uh, parents, you can work together to feed and protect your children spiritually so that they survive Jehovah's coming day. Uh, family heads, your family worship program is essential to your family's survival. Family worship is essential to the survival of children. So, so just to be clear, when the winds of divine wrath are circling the earth, when the angels and the 144,000 are going around on this murderous rampage, hacking people down in cold blood, they're not just interested in killing wicked people and evil people, murderers, thieves, sexual predators, that sort of person, people who are guilty of genocide. They're interested in killing Jehovah's Witnesses who've gotten discouraged and who've given up along the way. And they're also going to be killing, apparently, children whose parents haven't committed themselves sufficiently to doing family worship. In the following video, notice what we can learn about Jehovah's timing from the way he designed bees and cicadas to behave. If you heard a buzzing noise recently, there's a good chance you were in close proximity to one of these little critters, bees. There are other things that buzz, such as beard trimmers and some adult toys, but none of these will give you honey. Honey is delicious and can be eaten on toast with Greek yogurt or mixed with hot lemon and whiskey to make a nice hot toddy. But the bees make honey not for us humans, but as a clever way to store their favorite food, nectar, in a way that stops it fermenting and turning all gross and disgusting. We just come along and steal it from them. And that is how the honeybee do. Cicadas, on the other hand, do not make honey, but they do make a buzzing noise, as people living in parts of eastern North America will attest. The trouble is, unlike bees, which look kind of fluffy and adorable, cicadas look disgusting. It's true they do have an impressive lifespan of up to 17 years, which is among the longest of any insect. But the vast majority of this time is spent living as nymphs underground, ingesting liquid sucked from plant roots. Which is frankly where I would want to be if I looked anything like them. So I guess the gist of what I'm saying is that honeybees are awesome, whereas cicadas are hideous. Also hideous are hateful doomsday ideologies that preach death and destruction to all who think, love or live differently to the believer. Cult followers individually are often lovely, a bit like beautiful bees, but the vile bigoted teachings they've been indoctrinated with, often from birth, are like an infestation that belongs as deep underground as possible. Anyway, let's close with a random Bible verse. Therefore, the way I am running is not aimlessly. The way I am aiming my bowels is so as not to be striking the air. We've just been watching a video from the Friday afternoon session of the Jehovah's Witness Exercise Patience Convention that's been slightly edited <laughs> to make it more interesting. This particular talk that the video accompanies has the theme what creation can teach us about Jehovah's timing insects. It's actually presented on this occasion by Brandon French from the Wallkill, New York Bethel facility. Again, I took the liberty of redubbing the video because the original was just tedious, quite frankly, for the purpose of journalistic integrity. I will read you the original script from the video that I erased and talked over. Bees work hard and they have a lot to do. How do bees and other insects get their work done on time? Honeybees are adaptable. They organize their foraging to save time and energy and to visit flowers when they have plenty of nectar and pollen. The bees timing works out for all involved. Plants get pollinated and the bees make honey. 
This is the sound of cicadas in eastern North America. This variety develops underground for 17 years. Right on time, they emerge by the billions. They'll have just a few weeks to shed their skin and finish the most important work of their life, to find a mate and lay their eggs. Whether with an adaptable routine like the honeybee or a fixed one like the cicada, insects instinctively accomplish their work on time. We have an important work to do and a limited time to do it. With a regular schedule and by adapting it as needed, we can make wise use of our time. Therefore, the way I am running is not aimlessly the way I am aiming my... Oh, it was blows. Sorry. <laughs> is so as not to be striking the air. So, it's a video about bees and cicadas. And they've somehow managed to find a way to spin it in such a way as to remind Jehovah's Witnesses that they should be busy warning people that the world is about to end. As we watch the following video, notice what we can learn about Jehovah's timing from the daily cycles that he designed land mammals to follow. Oi, Bambi, get your furry ass back here. I was just about to talk about you. <sighs> Never mind. We can talk about something else, like maybe elephants. Here's a cute dog, what do I care? Point is, these are all land mammals, and mammals need sleep. When I have trouble sleeping, I find the best solution is to put on some cult propaganda. JW Broadcasting is especially good for getting you to the land of Nod if you leave it running in the background for a good while on a low volume. Even bats have been known to doze off when subjected to a concentrated dose of Samuel Heard. Of course, most animals can't operate electronic devices, especially if they're lions or frickin' polar bears. But if you sneak up on, say, a chimpanzee or hippo in a full body armor suit and blast it with some Kenneth Cook, chances are it will be knocked out before it can beat the living out of you. You also need to be careful just how much of that stuff you play. Back-to-back -back annual meetings and Gilead graduations have been known to put babies under for several weeks. Headaches are also a common side effect if you overdose on David's Splain, and you may need plenty of exercise outdoors to shake off any lingering feelings of discomfort or despair. If you binge on this stuff for weeks, you could go completely bonkers and start making cardboard cutouts of Bible characters. But even then, recovery can be possible. Some JW Broadcasting junkies have responded favorably when shown examples of where the New World Translation has been doctored to make it compatible with Jehovah's Witness teachings. The main cure is to focus on life's positives, such as our freedom of mind. As it says in the Bible, make sure of the more important things so that you may eat strawberries up to the date of expiry. Or something like that. We've just been watching a video segment from the Friday afternoon of this year's Exercise Patience Convention of Jehovah's Witnesses. This particular item with the theme, What Creation Can Teach Us About Jehovah's Timing Land Mammals. I have a confession to make, as you'll have seen in the title to this sushi, if you're watching it in sushi form, I have redubbed the narration to make it a bit more interesting. The original narration was kind of dull and, let's be frank, culty. So let me read, for the purposes of journalistic integrity, the original script to this video that I got rid of. Land mammals can stay active for long periods from the large to the not so large, but all of them need some time each day to sleep. African elephants get about two hours of sleep per day. Horses sleep for close to three hours. A wild sloth may doze for up to 14, as opposed to a domesticated sloth. <laughs> and a little brown bat can snooze for nearly 19. But how does sleep help them? Sleep allows the body to recuperate from the day's activities. And some scientists believe that sleep allows their brains to reset and remove toxins as if giving the brain a good scrub. 
It may also help to move the day's memories into long-term storage. We humans need sleep too. The younger we are, the more we need. We're not made to work constantly without sufficient rest and balanced recreation. Notice the insertion of the word balanced. It needs to be balanced recreation. There is such a thing, if you're a Jehovah's Witness, as unbalanced recreation, where you're not allowing sufficient time for kingdom work, for preaching and going to meetings and that sort of thing. Anyway, and unlike animals, we need time to refresh our faith and confidence in Jehovah. Our friendship with him must always be the most important thing in our life. I mean, I guess you'll have to take my word for it that it's in there. <laughs> All you need to do is, I suppose, wait for the video to be available on jw.org, which surely it will be at some point. But if you go to the actual convention and you listen to the video itself, you know what, here's a clip. Our friendship with him must always be the most important thing in our life. So there you go, there can be no doubt. In the original video, Jehovah's Witnesses were told that their relationship or friendship with Jehovah is the most important thing in their life. Not family, not friendships, not just being happy. The most important way you can spend your life, the most important thing you need to do with your life, if you're one of Jehovah's Witnesses, is have a friendship with Jehovah. So tonight, when it gets dark out and you start to get sleepy, remember that this is Jehovah's design. And remember the point, that he wants us to have a balanced routine. But why do we need to work in harmony with these natural cycles? If we're patient and we get sufficient sleep, we'll maintain good health. And in fact, the video mentioned some of those different benefits that we could enjoy. Do you remember some of them? It mentions sleep allows the body to recuperate. Uh, some believe that it helps the brain to reset and to remove toxins. And it also helps our long-term memory. But for us to get these full benefits, we need sufficient sleep. So how much sleep is that? Well, for adults, it's recommended that we get eight hours of sleep each night. Well, what happens if we're impatient and we try to accomplish more than is reasonable without sufficient sleep? We could actually harm ourselves and accomplish less in the long run. Chronic overwork has been linked to things like accidents, anxiety, uh, heart disease, and substance abuse. So as the Awake magazine cautioned, don't let your profession become your obsession. We know that sleep is a necessity, not a luxury. We've just been watching Bram Siegel, who is a Bethelite from the Warwick, New York headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses. He's taking us through the convention item, what creation can teach us about Jehovah's timing land mammals. And I found these particular words about sleep very, very interesting. So Bram Siegel has been, and I don't know how his surname is pronounced, so I'm just imagining Siegel <laughs> in my mind. But Bram Siegel has been arguing very eloquently for the need for sleep, for sufficient sleep. And he's been explaining that if you don't get enough sleep, this can have adverse effects, not just on your productivity, but on your health. So getting enough sleep is actually a health issue. You can be unhealthy. You, you can, I don't know, get sick, get very ill if you're not getting enough sleep. And if you get involved in, as he said there, chronic overwork... Compare these comments that Bram Siegel's just made with the following footage, which is a behind-closed-doors video that was made purely for Bethelites. It's a conversation between Kenneth Flodine, Governing Body Helper, and Ron Curzon, Governing Body Helper. Both are looking back on the early days of AVS, the Audio Video Services Department at Bethel, and they're specifically looking back 
on the very first ever installment of the Caleb and Sophia Become Jehovah's Friend cartoons, which was released at conventions as a DVD. I had another question for you. Uh, what many families are enjoying and young people are the animated series, Caleb and Sophia. Uh, it'd be kind of interesting to know the history of that. How did that start? Uh, there's a little bit of a backstory on that one. Um, probably now it's been maybe uh, 17 years ago. Um, we had done the Noah video with artwork, but it didn't move much. And we we're doing the David. And I approached the teaching committee at the time, which was a totally different teaching committee, totally different governing body, and said, wouldn't it be nice to do animated videos for children? At the time, they said no, because they didn't want to take the dignity of the message of God's word and reduce it to cartoons. Well, that's the faithful slave, and so I never said another word. But uh, about maybe 15 years after that, or 13 years after that, I asked to come down to Brooklyn, and one of the first things Brother Morris came up to me and said was that the governing body has approved animated videos for children. I went, whoa, 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 whoa. But the timing wasn't right back then. And probably the technology wasn't right back then. But now that was approved, and so I was just thrilled. But then he said, and we want it released at this next convention in as many languages as possible. And so I was like, whoa. So uh, as always, ABS steps up to the plate, makes it commission possible. And so uh, just to tell you what happened, that little crew they had done animation, moving the world around, making Bibles flow, but to do the human form is the most difficult. And so they got on the tools, but to, we have very difficult, hard due dates. And to make some of those dates, the brothers worked 30 hours straight on their computer. And we finally brought beds up into the department so that they could take a two or three hour nap and get back on their computer to finish it up. So it was just a, a beautiful thing. And look what it has done for the world. And they don't have that problem now. They got more help, but also we don't have to get seven languages on one DVD now. So that's what was the uh, kind of choke point on that one. Well, thanks for sharing that. And we appreciate all of your years of making what was impossible possible by means of Jehovah. Isn't that interesting? So when the first Caleb and Sophia cartoons were released, lessons one and two as a DVD at the convention, before the days of JW Broadcasting and the website, I think this was 2012, as memory serves, it was the whole Sparlock cartoon where Caleb comes home with a toy that his friend has given him. It's a warrior wizard. <laughs> and he has to throw it in the dumpster, in the wheelie bin, because otherwise he would be making Jehovah sad. That cartoon, we learn from this leaked video that ordinary Jehovah's Witnesses aren't supposed to watch, that Bethelites were working 30-hour shifts to get that video made. They were getting two to three-hour naps in between shifts, and beds were brought into the offices so that they could sleep near their desks. So how does that fit in with what Jehovah's Witnesses have just been told about not only how balanced sleep and getting enough sleep is advantageous, but how it's actually a health issue? And if you're not getting enough sleep, if you are in a cycle of chronic overwork, this is bad for your health. What does it say about Jehovah's organization if this is the sort of stuff they can justify in order to meet a deadline? If you're interested in watching the whole thing, by the way, here is a thumbnail to my televangelism video. There's actually quite a few more anecdotes, particularly from Ken Flodine, in that particular footage, which I think ordinary rank-and-file Jehovah's Witnesses would find quite illuminating. But what does it say about Jehovah's organization if sometimes in their projects and in their assignments they are making Bethelites complete tasks to arbitrary deadlines 
at the expense of their health. Mark 13, verse 37, Jesus said, but what I say to you, in other words, what I say to Peter, James, John, and Andrew, I say to all, keep on the watch. So it wasn't simply to the anointed, it was also to the other sheep. The other sheep, too, must heed this lesson. Yes, this parable is counsel and a warning to all of Christ's followers. But how can we apply the lesson on staying watchful? Well, we need to strengthen our conviction that the end is truly near. If I were to ask you what convinces you that we're close to the end, how would you respond? Uh, for instance, maybe you're thinking of first, Second Timothy, Second Timothy chapter three, verses one through five, the characteristics that would mark the last days. And that's true. People have no natural affection. They're without self-control. They're fierce. Road rage is angrier than ever. People have a short fuse and explode with very little provocation. Just recently, my wife Nadia and I were stopped at a red light and observed two drivers having a shouting match full of obscenities. We were happy that we weren't in the mix and that neither of them had a gun. But that is becoming commonplace in today's world. What about another uh, evidence that we're living close to the end? We're living in the time period symbolized by the feet of Nebuchadnezzar's dream image, the Anglo-American world power. Other nations may challenge it, but it will not be replaced according to Bible prophecy. That's amazing when we think about it and we look at what's happening on the world scene today. Yeah, that's amazing, isn't it? We've just been watching governing body member Gage Flegel, recently appointed governing body member Gage Flegel, speaking at this year's Exercise Patients Convention. This talk is from the Friday afternoon. His theme, you know, neither the day nor the hour. And as far as I can make out, Gage Flegel is encouraging Jehovah's Witnesses to strengthen their convictions that they are living in the last days. It's not a case of we are in the last days and here is irrefutable evidence. It's a case of you need to be convinced that we're in the last days. And if you're struggling in that department, allow me to throw you some scraps that might hint, that might satisfy you if your threshold for evidence is basically on the floor. <laughs> and the evidence that he's giving Jehovah's Witnesses, at least in the clip that we've just seen, is twofold. Number one, people have road rage. <gasps> the fact that people are shouting at each other in the street and using obscenities means we must be in the last days. And as a second knockout punch to convince people that we're living in the last days, Gage Flegel hits us with Anglo-America. <laughs> so the fact that Britain exists and America exists, and historically the two have been allies, continue to be allies, that means we're living in the last days. This is the sort of thing you would fall for as a Jehovah's Witness, this sort of flimsy argumentation. Neither of those two countries would accept if you were to interview your average American or your average Brit, and I am British, neither would say, oh yes, we're a tandem country, we're a tandem world power. Everything we do, everything we decide upon is influenced by the other. The whole Anglo-American nonsense makes no sense whatsoever. But if you're a Jehovah's Witness, it's not a case of whether you are personally persuaded by this. It's irrelevant whether you personally view Britain and America as a dual world power or the prophecy of the immense image in Daniel to be in some way foretelling world events nowadays. You don't have an option in, in all of this. You 
have to believe, otherwise you're an apostate and you could lose all of your family. Another evidence, Matthew 24, 14. You know those words by heart. The global preaching work is being accomplished. Well, what comes after the good news of the kingdom is preached in all the inhabited earth for a witness to all the nations? And then the end will come. Never before has the preaching work taken such global dimensions, reached in the very corners of the earth. Now, what motivation, what should that motivate us to do? Well, in harmony with the prophecy, or Jesus' parable, I should say, we have to realize that no one else can keep on the watch for us. It's something personal. We have to keep alert to the world scenes. The foolish virgins asked the discreet ones to give up some of their oil, but it was too late. The groom arrived and caught the foolish ones off guard. Well, we show by our decisions and life course whether or not we personally are keeping on the watch. We might ask ourselves, am I prepared and ready? If the Great Tribulation suddenly began tomorrow, would I be ready? Is my relationship with Jehovah where it needs to be for salvation? Would Jehovah view me as being marked for survival? Have I strengthened my trust in Jehovah? What are my priorities? Am I trying to squeeze as much as I can out of this system of things before it goes down? Or are my interests on storing up treasures in heaven? Our focus now should be getting out of the danger zone, being on Jehovah's side so that when destruction comes, we will be among the survivors. Yes, we need to be among the survivors when the destruction comes. This is what Jehovah's Witnesses are being told at this year's 2023 Exercise Patience Convention. Very doomsday, isn't it? Very dark. And let's remember that this is supposed to be an event that outsiders would find interesting. I mean, Jehovah's Witnesses even released a trailer to this convention thumbnail here if Tibor is gracious. So it's not like they are presenting this convention as something that is purely for believers. They are proud of this material and believe that it will be coherent and make sense even to people who haven't been raised as Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, Gage Flegel clearly didn't get that memo. <laughs> when he's talking all about destruction. Is my relationship with Jehovah where it needs to be for salvation? Would Jehovah view me as being marked for survival? Have I strengthened my trust in Jehovah? So in just a few words, we're learning that this convention is not about just developing patience and learning how to cope if we have a long wait at the doctor's surgery or while our car is being repaired, or if we're stuck in traffic, as Mark Sanderson said at the beginning, this is about developing a relationship with Jehovah so that you can be marked for survival. Well, how do we benefit from being diligent? Time passes more quickly when we're actively pursuing spiritual interests, when we're busy in Jehovah's service. Uh, remember the illustration from this morning? Essentially, we're in the waiting room at the doctor's office. When does time go most, more quickly? When we're staring at the clock on the wall or when we're engaged in giving a witness to others? Our preaching also means life for us and those who listen, a prospect that Jesus highlighted in his next parable. So I invite you to notice now chapter 25, verses 34 through 46. What is the third parable? Well, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, which is still future, he will separate people just as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. Sheep on his right hand, goats on his left. Well, what would be the criteria for determining who are like sheep and who are like goats? Essentially, whether or not they support Christ's anointed brothers. 
Yes, Jesus the King takes very personally the action shown toward his brothers or anointed ones. His third parable teaches the other sheep to remain loyal and to support the anointed fully. Now, how can we apply the lesson on remaining loyal? In one word, obedience. Obey the faithful slave and those appointed to represent that slave, including elders in the congregation. But why should we obey? Very interestingly, Revelation chapter 14, verse 4 says that the anointed keep following the Lamb, Christ Jesus, no matter where he goes. So if the faithful slave follows the Lamb, then the direction, the guidance that they provide is Bible-based. And we should obey it, <laughs> is the message here from Gage Flegel, recently appointed a governing body member. He's giving the final talk on the Friday of the Exercise Patients Convention with the theme, You Know Neither the Day Nor the Hour. Again, if his objective is to sound welcoming and not at all culty, <laughs> or sinister, or disturbing, he's failing miserably. I mean, he's just straight up telling his audience that they need to be obedient. In one word, obedience. Obey the faithful slave and those appointed to represent that slave, including elders in the congregation. Obey the faithful slave, which means obey the governing body, and obey their representatives in the congregation, namely the elders, there's no room for making a personal conscientious decision and saying, well, you know what? I'm supportive. I respect the elders in my congregation. I respect the governing body. I'm sure it's a challenging job that they do. But if I'm asked to do something that doesn't make any sense or even causes me harm or the ones I care about harm, you know what, I'm not going to do it. There's no space for that whatsoever in the Jehovah's Witness religion. It's do or die. You have to toe the line. You have to be obedient to any authority figure within this group or you can expect to be annihilated at Armageddon. Now, you could be watching this as someone who's never been one of Jehovah's Witnesses, and you could be thinking, how do people fall for this? <laughs> how do you sit in the audience and just absorb this overtly culty, controlling rhetoric, which is just outright saying, you need to obey or else, you need to obey without question, how does any of this sink in and how do people take this religion seriously? Well, we get a clue towards the beginning of this clip. Time passes more quickly when we're actively pursuing spiritual interests, when we're busy in Jehovah's service. When we're busy in Jehovah's service, time passes more quickly. Jehovah's Witnesses are too busy to be asking questions. They're too busy to analyze these words or really think about their religion and what it's asking of them and the fact that their religion ultimately doesn't make sense. When you are on this constant hamster wheel of preaching, studying, attending meetings, attending conventions, family worship, you have all of these various activities taking up your time and you have sports and recreation, things that can just give your brain a bit of breathing space, frowned upon. And you're told that you need to do those things in moderation, but there's practically, practically no limit to how much time you can devote to being a Jehovah's Witness. You never have time to ask any questions, and you certainly don't have time to question a newly appointed governing body member when he stands on the platform and effectively says, obey or else. Just as Christ has affection for the congregation, 
so too does the governing body. We love you. The governing body prays constantly for the worldwide brotherhood. So obedience is necessary for loyalty. But another way is to support the work of Jehovah's organization. How? Well, the small group of anointed ones can't possibly complete the preaching work on their own. That's where we need your support. We need your help in this preaching activity. Then there's also the constructing of kingdom halls, assembly halls, places of worship, branch facilities used in Jehovah's service, and also donating to the worldwide work. Here's an experience from Mexico. A little girl we'll call Laura, age six, lives in Mexico. Sadly, she suffers from epilepsy. And after one particularly difficult hospital visit, her older sister gave her a piggy bank as a gift. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Laura received money from her family to use for school or to buy treats. And what did she do with the money? She decided to save the money in her piggy bank, depositing it there. Well, when in-person meetings resumed, Laura brought her piggy bank to the kingdom hall. What did she do with it? After the meeting, she broke it open, counted the money she saved, and it totaled 350 pesos, or about 17 United States dollars. She contributed the entire amount, giving half to support the local congregation and the other half to the worldwide work. Laura explained, I wanted to donate my savings for our brothers to use and to send more brothers to preach in foreign lands. Think about it. All of this was going through the mind of a six-year-old. She also asked for another piggy bank, of course, so that she could start saving once again. But that's not all. She's trying to learn to read and write so that she personally can share the good news with others. She can tell others about her loving God, Jehovah. By her actions, that little girl is essentially gathering at Jesus' right hand among the sheep. She's precious to Jehovah. She's precious to Jesus. She's precious to each one of us here in attendance. What? A creep. <laughs> I'm sorry, Gage Flegel. You may be a newly appointed governing body member, but you're not endearing yourself to me at this point. I mean, fresh out of the gates, you're showing the mindset that it takes to get to the highest echelon of the Jehovah's Witness organization. You need to be the type of soulless creep who celebrates an, a six-year-old epileptic girl giving all of her money to the organization. You have to be the sort of person who thinks that's fantastic. And as though Laura, this epileptic girl, came up with this idea all by herself, I don't think it was quite that simple. That the governing body will continue everything in our power to provide the needed relief aid to our dear brothers in these affected areas. We love you very much and thank you for tuning in for this update. I wish we this could help. Me too. Oh, I have an idea. Sweetie, can I give this to our brothers affected by the hurricane? Of course you can. We'll put it in the contribution box on Sunday. I don't know, maybe I'm being overly cynical, but it feels like that Caleb and Sophia cartoon might have played at least some role in Laura's decision to empty her piggy bank, or sorry, break her piggy bank, to get at $17, and the piggy bank was a gift... 
So straight away, children are being taught to have a very unhealthy view of gifts in relation to the urgency of giving money to the organisation. And then, of course, we have another Caleb and Sophia cartoon. I mean, it's obvious, isn't it, where Laura got her idea from? She's been subjected to targeted child propaganda, coercing children to turn over any money that they might have that's been given to them for their needs to the organisation. So kids have to go without ice cream. They have to go without... What was it? Laura was given money for her school and for treats. So she then has less money for when she goes back to school. She has less money for treats. This is supposed to be a positive. This is something that the organisation is proud of. Gage Flegel is stood on the stage trumpeting this story as something that Jehovah's Witness parents and their children should be trying to copy in their lives, even if they have epilepsy. I'm sorry, this guy, Gage Flegel, he may be newly appointed to the governing body, and I'm sure he's bringing a lot of confidence to that role. But immediately, right out of the gates, I am getting a very bad feeling about this guy's moral compass. Well, during the fast, past few months, while visiting family, I've had a chance to watch both literal sheep and goats. I've observed some very interesting things. Uh, for instance, sheep are somewhat shy creatures. Uh, they didn't even want me to take a photo of them. They were docile, protective of their young, helpless and fearful without a shepherd. What about goats? Well, goats are a little different. Recently, my three-year-old ne little nephew was feeding carrots to a few goats through a wooden fence. And he had a little plastic Ziploc bag full of carrots that was on the ground. He would grab one carrot from the plastic bag. He would feed it to the goat, grab another carrot, feed it to the goat. Well, he decided that he wanted to make that a little quicker. So he grabbed the plastic bag full of carrots. What did the goat do? It reached through the fence, grabbed the whole bag, the next thing we had goats fighting over the carrots. Carrots were everywhere. What did the goat finally do? The goat ate the carrots, but it also even ate the plastic bag. What's the moral of the story? Don't be a goat. Goats are independent. They're self-serving. At times they'll even eat garbage. Well, if we want to please Jehovah God and Christ, we need to be sheep-like, humble, loyal, willing to be led by the shepherd. Well, there's a surprise. Apparently a governing body member wants followers of the governing body to be docile and shy and timid and easily led. He doesn't want them to be independent. Who knew? What do I even need to add? He's listed as the qualities of sheep, the things that make sheep so noteworthy in his mind, the fact that they are shy, helpless, docile, fearful, 
and protective of their young. I think I can guess why being fearful would be an attribute that he likes in sheep or in Jehovah's Witnesses. If Jehovah's Witnesses are terrified of this bogeyman under the bed, this Satan or Satan system of things, and Gage Flegel and his governing body companions can come riding to the rescue, dangling their carrots <laughs> and presenting the cure for this fear, presenting this fancy utopia in which this bogeyman needn't be feared anymore. You can understand why fear is useful. And you can understand why it's useful for Jehovah's Witnesses to not be too independent, to not think for themselves, to instead be shy and helpless and docile. Because when you are all those things, of course it's easier for charlatans like Gage Flegel to come along and control you. Anyway, those were my thoughts on the Friday afternoon session of this year's 2023 Exercise Patience Convention of Jehovah's Witnesses. Stay tuned to the Lloyd Evans channel. Keep it right here for rebuttals to the remaining sessions, the Saturday morning, afternoon, Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, which you'll be able to watch either in long format or sushi format however you prefer. But until then, I hope you've enjoyed this rebuttal and found it useful in some way. And as always, thank you for watching.